So you knew Rama was going to attack during the full moon because you knew he needed the light. Smart, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Are you guys going to attack him? Huh? Yeah, you are. But not until the full moon because you need the light. I see. Okay. Yeah. See ya. September 11th, 1942. You are not a career military man. Sure, you served as a young man during wartime, but that was years ago. Since you came to power, though, you've had to work closely with your armed forces for many years. And since your country went to war, that work has grown closer and constant. But one day, that's not enough. You are unsatisfied. So you take personal control of your armies, pushing aside the field marshal himself. You can obviously do it better. You are Adolf Hitler. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Axis forces reached the suburbs of Stalingrad, but the Soviet defense was tenacious, and they even began counterattacks to cut off the advancing enemy. In the Caucasus, Axis forces tried and failed to break out of the Mozdok bridgehead or take Novorossiysk on the coast. They also failed in North Africa, as Elvin Rommel's forces were unable to take Alam Halfa Ridge. Far to the east, the Japanese have realized the importance of retaking Guadalcanal and subordinate their other operations to that primary goal. That does not mean they're abandoning those operations, though. The Battle of Mission Ridge is fought this week in the jungle on the Kokoda Track, which the Japanese are attempting to cross to take Port Moresby. Brigadier Arnold Potts had decided to make a stand, as I said last week, but the battle is a decisive Japanese victory, and the Australians are pushed back the rest of the week but help will soon be on its way. See, the Japanese are evacuating Milne Bay, though only 600 or so men will escape that debacle of a battle that cost them 2,000. But then, since he doesn't have to focus on them anymore, Allied Theater Commander Douglas MacArthur can focus on the Kokoda Track Campaign, which might be good because the Japanese break through the gap on the track this week on the 5th and are now heading downhill towards Port Moresby. MacArthur will now send in a force of the Australian 17th Division to try and stem the tide. Here's the thing though, the Japanese are sending reinforcements to Guadalcanal now in nightly runs. General Kiyotake Kawaguchi has some 6,200 men there by now. The only reinforcements Alexander Vandergrift and the US Marines there have gotten is a construction battalion, Seabees, that came last week, and they're not combatants. They do have a huge part to play there, though, mainly fixing and filling the shell holes and bomb craters that the Japanese put in Henderson Field every day so that the 60-plus aircraft now operating from there are able to actually fly. But the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff are not willing to divert a single plane or ship to the Pacific from Operation Torch, the Allies' autumn plan to invade Vichy French Northwest Africa. Keeping that airstrip open is the key to survival, since those planes give the Allies daytime control of the approaches so supplies can be brought in. At night, control of the waters belongs more to the Japanese, who emphasized that again this week by sinking two destroyer transports on the 5th. On the 8th, the Marines do launch a raid just before dawn against Kawaguchi's base, but it's too late. Yep. His force has already left Tevu Point for their attack positions along the same path that Kionao Ishiki followed three weeks ago. Well, followed on his way to being slaughtered. Kawaguchi believes that with several times Ishiki's force, he can take the American positions. His plan is to split his force east of the Tenaru with the main force hitting the Marines, a secondary force cutting across and hitting the airfield while Imperial Marines land and also hit the field from the other side. It's actually more complicated than that, and he further splits his forces so that he will have five battalions attacking on three lines of advance. The attack will go off tomorrow. But one Axis attack is limping to its end this week, the Battle of Alam El Halfa in North Africa, which we saw last week. The battle is not very costly relatively in terms of men. 2,910 casualties for Elvin Rommel's Axis forces and 1,710 for Bernard Montgomery's British 8th Army. But the 49 tanks Rommel has lost are way, way harder to make up than the 67 the 8th Army has. 
The Battle of Alam El Halfa was chiefly important because a major German thrust had been effectively halted, and the 8th Army and the Desert Air Force had jointly won an easily recognizable victory which had the immensely valuable results of restoring the Army's faith in itself and the RAF, and of giving it real confidence in its new commander, who had predicted exactly the course the battle would follow. At last it seems that the 8th Army had found an answer to Rommel, and morale rose to an unprecedented height. Let's also remember that it has been a real combined services battle, since the Royal Navy did a big job as well in the Mediterranean in sabotaging Rommel's supply lines. He accepted Kesselring's assurance that he could fly in 90,000 gallons of gasoline a day, and relied on a large tanker due in Tobruk at the end of August. Kesselring did in fact fulfill his promise, but most of the gasoline was consumed on the long journey to the front while the sinking of the precious tanker by a submarine off Tobruk Harbor on the 31st of August put an end to any hope of a victorious battle. There are those who would give credit to former theater commander Claude Auchinleck as much as to Montgomery for the battle. But this is not fair to Monty. Sure, Auchinleck had wanted to fight at Alam Halfa, but you know, that's where Rommel attacked. And very, very importantly, Auchinleck's plans were for a mobile defensive battle in the whole region there, and not defending the ridge and using the armor in fixed positions, which is a big difference and something 8th Army had never done. Montgomery also managed to fight the battle by divisions and not by brigades, and we've not seen that before. And you might think that, well, maybe they should have gone after Rommel after fighting him off like some lower level commanders wanted to do. But remember, Operation Torch is coming fairly soon, and the last thing the Allies want is Rommel in established positions with a strong supply line someplace like El Agela. They want him in Egypt with a long and crappy supply system. However, Monty's and current theater commander Harold Alexander's plans for their own offensive have been delayed. See, they need a period of full moon moonlight, since they plan to break through enemy minefields with a nighttime infantry assault. How else are you going to do it? That's when Rommel just attacked, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill wants the 8th Army attack to come at the full moon at the end of September. But they managed to convince him that this won't work, so it will be scheduled for October 23rd, 14 days before the torch landings are supposed to happen. This also means that if Rommel does not withdraw or break through before then, then however the battle goes for 8th Army, Rommel will be stuck between two enemy forces, and he'll be too far away from the one in the west to do much good, even if he can break out. Other Axis forces are trying to break out this week, over in the Caucasus. They continue trying to break out of the Mosdok bridgehead as the week begins, with Ewald von Kleist committing more German armor, even as the Soviets reinforce the 9th and 44th armies. By the 6th, two full tank battalions have crossed, but that night, 20-year-old Soviet pilot Marina Chesneva of the Night Witches scores a direct hit and blows the Germans' pontoon bridge. They do fix it soon enough, but they are not making headway. NKVD, that's the Soviet State Security Forces and Secret Police, boss Lavrenti Beria, has suggested to Joseph Stalin that Ivan Maslenikov should command down here, a suggestion he heeds. On the 8th, he comes in to take over the northern group on the Terek River. Maslenikov was not a bad choice for a defensive operation, since he could enforce discipline and motivate subordinates with threats of sending them to the Gulag. But his ability to coordinate four armies was negligible. He is not the only change in command this week. Wilhelm List, commander of German Army Group A, running the entire offensive in the region, loses his command. On the 9th, Adolf Hitler decides to relieve him, and the next day Wilhelm Keitel flies down to tell him. The ongoing stalemate at Mosdok Bridge is what finally convinces Hitler that the Caucasus adventure is not going so well, and he blames List, accusing him of not properly deploying his troops, which is true to a certain extent. He's used the infantry and the panzers and the wrong types of terrain. He's focused on the mountains instead of Kleist's drive on Grozny. But you know, it is Hitler who has not given List the resources to make the campaign work in the first place. Hitler also surprises everyone by announcing that he will take personal command of Army Group A. But Kleist is in reality going to act as Army Group commander there in the field. In the fighting to the west on the coast on the 7th, 
German infantry fights its way into Novorossiysk, and after another few days of fighting, it is fully occupied. But it has been a long and costly battle, two weeks of fighting. Wilhelm Wetzel tries to advance down the coast towards Tuaps, but he is stopped at the end of the week at the cement factory south of Novorossiysk. There, the front line will remain. Another city proving to be a costly battle to take, or to even reach, is Stalingrad. On the 5th, the Soviets renew their counterattacks against the Axis corridor from the Don to the Volga, now with four armies. The fighting that day, well, that day and all the rest of the week, is bloody and brutal and extremely costly for the Soviets in men, but the bitter truth was that Zhukov's entire offensive had stalled and done so irrevocably. Nevertheless, driven on by Stalin's entreaties and threats, Zhukov insisted the four armies continue their assaults, if only to slow Paulus's advance into Stalingrad. The armies did so woodenly through September 13th, even though Zhukov had already decided two days before that any action would be futile. But though they cannot take the corridor, they are doing a fair job of diverting German 6th Army forces from attacks on the city. Already on the 5th, Paulus halts the 51st Army Corps' drive on the city and sends its air support to the north. And the 14th Panzer Corps as well must block partial Soviet penetrations in the corridor all week long. On the 6th, its commander Gustav von Wietersheim tells Paulus, Friedrich Paulus, 6th Army commander, he needs more air support and more infantry, even if that means indefinitely delaying the attack on the city, since that could wait until they've secured their northern front. Paula says it's the opposite. Taking the city is the first step to securing the northern front. Well, 14th Panzer Corps is kept so busy, they don't capture the city's northern factory district. They do not get the chance to attack it in force. Orlovka and Rinok remain in Soviet control. Despite the diversion of the attacks on the corridor, though, the Axis makes some gains on the 6th from Orlovka around to Gomrak. But not much more than that. Paulus hopes on the 7th, though, that 51st Army Corps can resume its drive and grind its way into the city and take the west bank of the Volga. They gain ground, but because of the attacks on the corridor and because Hamarhot's 4th Panzer Army's attacks from the south, are stopped for a few days by the flanking threat of the Duggan 64th Army, Paulus orders the 51st to turn to the northeast on the 9th, help Wietersheim take the Soviets' Orlovka salient. The upshot of all this, once Hoth gets going again, is from the perspective of Vikes, Army Group B's commander, the heavy fighting along the western approaches to Stalingrad from the 5th to 9th of September has the beneficial effect of having the distance between the advancing 51st Army and 48th Panzer Corps and the Volga River. The fighting had also significantly reduced the danger that Stalingrad Front's four armies posed to 14th Panzer Corps in the fragile corridor to the Volga River north of Stalingrad. And on the 10th, the 29th Motorized Division finally breaks through to the Volga on the southern side of the city at Kuporoznoye. And that day, the Soviet 62nd Army is hit along its line from north to south, with its units in the center defending just two kilometers from the heart of the city. The suburbs are slowly falling. A wedge has been driven between 62nd and 64th Army. The Orlovka salient is shrinking. Paulus and Hoth are making final adjustments for their final assault on the city of Stalingrad. And the week comes to an end. I know, it's getting pretty exciting. But that is it for the week. A week that sees the suburbs of Stalingrad slowly falling, parts of the Caucasus slowly falling, the Kokoda track slowly falling, but Guadalcanal and El Alamein gaining in strategic importance for both sides and neither looking like it's about to fall. And Hitler has personally taken control over an entire army group. And he is not a general. He has, as we've seen, however, had some good hunches and orders during the war, notably last December in the USSR. But his conflicting orders day after day in mid-July sabotaged the entire offensive in the East. The Caucasus campaign has taken a decent amount of territory, but territory is not its goal. And the army group is now spread out from Novorossiysk to Mozdok, and the arrival of the snows means crossing the mountain passes before spring is out of the question. The supply lines are precarious, and fuel is in short supply, and Grozny must fall, and Stalingrad must fall, and Leningrad must fall, and Suez must fall. He has his work cut out for him. 
the night witches, or the Nachthexen, as the German soldiers who feared them called them, are just plain legendary. If you want to learn more about these amazing women, we did an episode, well, we did two, actually, on them over on the Sabaton History Channel. And you can check out the first of those right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is James Harmon. The Army is what finances our productions. So to get ever more of them, join the Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.